So again, welcome to this uh, so talk on regenerative oceans. Today we're going to question uh, how we can regenerate our oceans, strengthen our food systems, restore and rewild vulnerable areas, and what we can do to solve the underlying challenges our oceans face and create the conditions in which the ocean can rebuild itself. This is the fourth and last uh, seminar in the series of regenerative practices. And if you missed the previous ones, we did one on um, one that introduced regenerative practices, one that focused on regenerative agriculture, and one on regenerative city development. And if you missed them, they are open on our YouTube channels and you can find them there. And today we're going to be diving into the oceans looking at why we need regenerative practices to reverse rising temperatures, uh, increase acidity, as well as biodiversity loss in our oceans. And we're gonna use the Indian Ocean as a case and we aim to discover possibilities for action and mobilize people with knowledge and drive and present a few examples of regenerative ocean practices. And my name is Sofia from So Central, co-hosting this event. And we aim to build partnerships between public and private sector and civil society. And we do so in building arenas, partnerships, and through concrete exper uh, experiments and projects. And if you're curious on what we do, you can read more uh, about us on our website that we can post in the chat. And for all of you Norwegian speakers in the audience, feel free to sign up to our newsletters to get um, invitations for events such as this one. Uh, but also to get first-hand information about what's moving in the social innovation scene here in Norway. Unfortunately, this newsletter is currently just in Norwegian, so that's why I mentioned uh, only Norwegian speakers. And today we have a really interesting lineup of speakers. We uh, are going to hear from Shama Sandoya, uh, who is a marine biologist and a climate activist from Mauritius who held the world's first underwater climate strike as a part of Fridays for Future in the heart of the Indian Ocean. Shama will tell us about the state of the Indian Ocean and her story of what she's seen and learned about the health of our oceans and why we need to revitalize and regenerate them. After we've heard from Shama, we're gonna move on to Vida Helgesen, executive director of the Noble Foundation, uh, formerly Nor Norway's Minister of Climate and Environment, Minister of European Affairs, among other public positions in the Norwegian government. And as Norway's special representative for the ocean, he led the group of Sherpas for the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, which presented its conclusions in December 2020. And based on the scientific and policy work of the ocean panel, uh, Mr. Helgesen will give us an introduction of why we need to think regenerative and act now to rebuild our oceans if we are to reverse climate change. And then last but not least, we will hear from Birgit Lielden. And Birgit is the founder and CEO of the Ocean Opportunity Lab. She's a self-made entrepreneur who has worked to push sustainability, entrepreneurship, next generation and diversity across the maritime industry for almost 15 years. She's one of the most visible young female leaders within the global maritime uh, industry and the first leader fronting the Me Too in global shipping. She started her first company at uh, 28 and became the first female director of a global leading shipping expo at the age of 32. In 2020, uh, Birgit was named a top 100 global maritime female profile, chaired NASDAQ ESG Summit, UN Environmental Assembly, Act for Nature, and spoke at the official IMO World Maritime Day Global Panel. So as you can hear, there's some really interesting speakers uh, and participants uh, in this series of four. And some of you might be interested in staying connected with this topic. So how can you do so? What happens next? Uh, my colleague Thomas will also tell you about this a little bit later. So. Uh, let's get right into it, and we're going to hear from uh, marine biologist Shama Sandoya first, so I'll give the screen to you, and thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you, Sophia. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Shama. So today I'm going to be talking to you about um, the state of the Indian Ocean, which, 
what, what we saw when we went for an expedition earlier this year. So basically, after seeing the state of the Indian Ocean, we know that this area needs ocean protection. Um, basically, the Indian Ocean is really big. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the whole of the Indian Ocean because, um, well, it's very big. But as you can see that the Indian Ocean, it's landlocked. It means that it is uh, surrounded by land. So that's one thing that separates the uh, Indian Ocean from the Atlantic and the Pacific as well. Um, I'm going to be focusing more on the Southwest Indian Ocean. So that's more where Mauritius is, uh, Madagascar and uh, La Réunion, Rodrigue, Seychelles, etc. So basically, we know that uh, the Indian Ocean is threatened by many things and uh, the Southwest Indian Ocean is threatened by increasing temperatures, by intensive fishing and plastic pollution, deep sea mining as well. And uh, um, yeah, I, I wanted to see to put like um, more things about what are the threats that are actually occurring here, but we're not really hearing about it because um, there are more pressing, pressing issues, but also we are seeing that the Indian Ocean uh, is being affected, affected by these things. And these things are impacting the local communities as well on islands. So um, these areas you see here, the little dot, the little comma here, um, just on top of Mauritius that extends from Mauritius to Seychelles, next to Madagascar is called the Mascarene Plateau. So basically the Mascarene Plateau is known as a marine biodiversity hotspot. So um, we know that this area is rich in biodiversity, but it hasn't been really documented because it's an uncharted region. It has a change of depth that is very drastic and not many people had enough time, um, enough resources to go there and, and to study the area. So basically with the team of the, with Greenpeace, we went there for an expedition earlier this year during the month of March. And we went there mainly to study the biodiversity. And um, we know that this area, the Mascarene Plateau, it has a, a, a bank, which is called the Sal de Mala. And it is actually the world's largest seagrass meadow. So basically why we need meadows, uh, seagrass meadows is that they absorb the carbon from the atmosphere. They play a really important role in the climate. And they also welcome um, a rich biodiversity. They welcome sea turtles, dolphins, they act as a nursery for fish, and they are also very important for the growth of corals as well. So um, we did an expedition to make like a, like a study of the biodiversity and to see about the ecosystems. And also, uh, this is like Sophia mentioned, I, I took part of the, in the first world, in the world's first underwater climate strike. So basically, this is where what we found at the Sa de Mala. Um, as you can see, it has a lot of sea grosses. And uh, personally, this is the first time that I'm seeing um, a seafloor as thriving with sea grosses as that, because usually they are being dredged because they are not really aesthetic. They are not really nice for the feet as well. But um, I think it's really important that we take a look at how green that is. And it's like um, it has been it has it has been uh, shot in a depth of maybe 16 meters, 20 meters. So the whole bank of the Sahara de Mala is not very deep. It's actually shallow. And this is how we can see um, the sea grass is growing. And we can also see corals there. But what's really interesting about the, this place is that we don't have only one species of coral that's dominating the ecosystem. It's several species of them. And we have lots of fish and sharks as well, and turtles and dolphins coming around to play. So it's very interesting to see how these two ecosystems, they are linked and um, they are really important for each other. So um, basically what we saw at the Sahara de Mala is a combination of sedations, seabirds, sharks, rays, and, um, and whale shark. And it was very interesting to see that we found out some local populations of, um, of sperm whales there. And we have been taking some pictures which are going to be uh, identified, which are going to be sent over to some uh, cetacean experts in the region here, well, um, at La Réunion. And, uh, and we took up some, some data, some co we collected some water samples for eDNA analysis to understand uh, if there are some animals which we didn't see there, but which, which were in the water. And these are some of the pictures of what we saw. So on top left, you can see that it's a red-footed uh, booby. 
uh, and on the on the bottom you can see it's a masked booby and on the right you can see that we saw um, sperm whales and brooders whales it was very interesting to spot these cetaceans there but i also want to talk about something that's really important because when we were at the Sahara de mala we knew that uh, some of some people there spotted some blue whales and we thought that maybe the blue whales they came they came from Diego Garcia because Diego Garcia has a local population of blue whale there and what is really important to understand is that these threats that are, that I'm that are happening in the ocean about plastic about industrial fishing uh, rising temperatures etc they are not the only things that are happening it's also about um, the military bases that exist in the Indian Ocean um, I'm going to talk about it because I see that it's not an, it's not something that everyone is talking right now but it's very important especially in the history of Mauritius right now where we are seeing a military base being constru constructed on Agaliga so why is this uh, why is this really bad is because um, the military bases, they generate waste, they generate pollution, and they, they make a lot of sound, they make a lot of noise in the water, and these can affect the marine biodiversity as well. So um, as we can see here in Agaliga, Agaliga, it just added to the list of military bases that exist already in the Indian Ocean. And uh, well, it's not okay because we don't really know what what are what is the biodiversity here, and it could be that Agaliga has its own endemic species in the water, and they they might have their own um, populations of cetaceans, of sharks, etc. But we don't know that yet because no studies has been really conducted there, and uh, yet we have like large inf infrastructure on the island. So. Um, this is an example of a military base on Chagos and uh, Diego Garcia, and it's like you can, as you can see, it's really bad. It's very heavy for for the land. It's too much for the capacity, and some studies have found out that the look that the population of blue whales in uh, in near Diego Garcia they have been producing some really inconsistent sounds, uh, which no one has found elsewhere around the planet. So it hasn't been really uh, linked to the activities there yet, but it could be potentially because of the noises made by the ships. And um, some other scientists found out that the military base is polluting the water a lot around Diego Garcia, and it's actually being declared, well, it's actually declared a marine protected area, but is it really protected? So, um, this is what I wanted to show you a bit about the Indian Ocean. It's becoming um, a really busy place, but it is already a busy place, but it has a lot of life in here. It's very unique and, and this is home to so many people around here. And uh, this is why we need to protect it because some people, well, many people depend on it. They depend on the fish, they depend on the resources, they live near the coast. And according to scientists, if we want to protect the biodiversity, the marine biodiversity in the ocean, we need to protect at least 30% of the ocean around the planet by 2030. So that means specifically to protect the ocean in the high seas. And in order to do that, we need to make the right decisions and to take action now because we can't, we can't wait for, for any longer. So that was it. I hope it was, um, it was nice to see the things that we saw in the Indian Ocean and the state of it. And it inspires every one of us to make a change right now. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Shama, for telling about the things you've seen and know. And remember, everyone in the audience, if you have any questions, either for Shama or any of the other speakers, feel free to write that in the chat and we'll bring it up. So we're just going to jump on to the next speaker, Vidar Hergesen. Uh, the, screen, the screen is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. And uh, let me start by saying that uh, choosing the theme of regenerative oceans and that title is really spot on because uh, um, the default position of the ocean is to generate and regenerate and regenerate. So as long as we as humans allow the ocean to generate, it's gonna do it. Uh, the problem is right now, we're not allowing uh, the ocean to regenerate. The re regenerative capacity of the ocean is being undermined. And that's uh, really what we need to address. Uh, Shama, oh, I need to, I'm not able to flip these uh, slides. 
Uh, there we go. Tama uh, talked about the Indian Ocean as being thick, and obviously that's uh, correct. The ocean as a whole is big. Um, we all know, of course, that it's covering 70% of the world's surface. Um, I like this map in particular because it does show that if you put all land mass of the Earth together, it will fit within the Pacific Ocean. It's just an illustration of just how big it is. And that might be a part of the problem because we have traditionally been thinking of the ocean as too big to fail. Uh, I, have a, I, I grew up in an island community in Norway and uh, there were many uh, seafarers in the community and one of my best friends uh, had a dad and he went, uh, a seafaring dad, and he went, often went with him during summer holidays on the ships. And uh, his, one of his favorite activities on that ship uh, was when he was called on to help dealing with the garbage, the waste aboard, um, on board the ship. What they did was to put it all in big black waste sacks and then uh, store it at the back of the ship. And then every now and then, every other day, they uh, needed his help to throw these sacks overboard. Um, this was probably not the only ship globally dealing with waste in that way. Uh, along the Norwegian coast, you'll find car wrecks, you'll find dishwashers and washing machines. Um, and that's the case in too many places around the world. Because we've had this image that the ocean is too big to fail. You simply leave things in the oceans and they leave your world. Over time, obviously, we've realized that that's not the case. And today, ocean problems are monumental. The plastic problem um, is the most visible, which um, I think has left many people with a sense that, goodness, is this too big to fix? This picture from Indonesia here, for example, can certainly give you that impression. Um, but um, plastic pollution is not the only issue. Uh, there's also nutrient pollution, nutrient runoff from agriculture, leaving low oxygen zones in big parts of uh, the global ocean, uh, marked in blue on this uh, world map, but also with red dots indicating more localized uh, problems. There is, of course, the impact of climate change, which is undermining uh, natural habitats, and there's overfishing and illegal fishing uh, adding to that problem. So from a situation historically, when we thought of the ocean as too big to fail, today we can get the impression that it's too big to fix. The problem is if we stay with that attitude, we're not gonna be able to repair it. What we need is to recognize that the ocean is too big and too important to ignore. And that was much of the motivation behind the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, which is a group initiated by uh, Norway with 14 heads of state uh, and government worldwide. Uh, you may say that 14 countries aren't that many, but they do occupy about 30% of the world's ex exclusive economic zones, almost 40% of the world's coastlines. Um, and they're now inviting other um, countries to join in. Uh, that endeavor had these 14 heads of state, but also uh, about 250 scientists and experts globally doing tremendous work uh, to prepare the politicians for knowledge-based uh, decision-making. And among the findings uh, from the scientists that have been taken on board by, uh, by the politicians is that we have at the same time tremendous problems. We have core planetary functions essential to humanity that are being undermined by human activity in the ocean and affecting the ocean uh, that we need to address. But at the same time, tremendous opportunities uh, for solving problems and benefiting uh, humankind at the same time. Uh, we found that if we take better care of nature, if we restore 30% uh, of the ocean uh, with uh, marine protected areas, we can, uh, and if we address uh, climate change, we can add 12 million new jobs from the ocean, uh, ocean economy by 2030. We can have uh, more than 15 trillion US dollars in benefits from sustainable ocean investment. 
we can produce six times more seafood by 2050 if we do things in a better way in terms of uh, ocean management. And importantly, we can produce and need to produce about 40 to 50 times more renewable energy, particularly through offshore wind by 2050. You may be aware of, uh, of the uh, ocean or, or the, the warming stripes that uh, Ed Hawkins, the climate scientist, have popularized. He's also done uh, warming stripes for different ocean territories, indicating the development of oceans um, temperatures between 1901 and 2018. This is showing a global pattern that is uh, alarming uh, and most alarming actually uh, where um, Thomas and I and many of you spend your, their time, your time, uh, namely by and with and at times in the Arctic Ocean, where temperatures are really uh, critically uh, increasing. And this of course leaves us thinking of the ocean as a victim of climate change and that it is a victim of climate change. But the ocean is also a solution to climate change. And that's one of the key findings of uh, the panel. One thing is obviously that the ocean is storing much of the excess warming that is going on, much of carbon, it's a big carbon sink globally. Um, but we also have opportunities through additional action to improve and increase the role of the ocean as a solution to climate change. What our scientists found is that the ocean or actions relating to the ocean can deliver up to a fifth of what the world needs to get to the 1.5 degree target, particularly through investing in ocean-based renewable energy, but also by decarbonizing ocean transport, uh, by restoring and sustaining uh, coastal and marine ecosystems, be they mangroves or seaweed or other, or seagrass, through increasing Protein production from the ocean. Seafood is way better in terms of a source of protein than land-based uh, food production. And finally, through carbon capture and storage in the seabed, which is a complicated but also necessary endeavor in order to combat climate change. All of these things have positive climate effects, but also positive effects on job creation, uh, social effects. There was an analysis made of the side effects of these uh, actions for all the SDGs, and mainly the results were uh, very, very positive. So the ocean presents opportunities. Um, after we delivered the uh, report, uh, there has been a new study coming out, which we were aware of uh, when producing the report, but it's, it's been published only recently which is adding some very critical and important knowledge. One is that the seabed is also storing carbon. It's not only the water column, the water mass, but also the seabed because we have sediments uh, on the seafloor storing carbon. Um, resulting, of course, in the, um, the fact that bottom trawling, which we have traditionally seen as a big challenge to biodiversity, is actually also a potentially very big challenge to um, climate action, because when it's uh, when bottom trawling is releasing sediments uh, on the seafloor, it's also releasing carbon, and it may be uh, as big a source of global emissions as the total of air traffic globally. This is a study led by Enric Sala from National Geographic, uh, published, published in Nature not so long ago. Uh, and interestingly, they've done this map globally of where the critical uh, areas for protecting uh, the seafloor uh, in terms of carbon sediments would be. They also looked at biodiversity and the need for us to um, identify the areas where biodiversity protection is most critical. And similarly, in terms of food protect production, where can we protect uh, ocean territory that would give the biggest yields, the biggest benefits in terms of food production? Um, you may think, well, if we protect an area, then if you can't fish there, there's not going to be more food. There's going to be less food uh, production from the ocean. But the opposite is true, because when you restore natural habitat through protection, uh, fish are, are allowed to get bigger. And when fish get bigger, they produce disproportionately more kids. And those kids, of course, 
swim out of these protected areas. So uh, there can be more fish production, even more wild fish production uh, than previously thought uh, through targeted uh, knowledge-based establishment of marine protected areas. Uh, these findings are enormously important. Uh, they've also produced this overlapping map where these three dimensions are added. So you can identify in a much more strategic way which areas globally are the most important to protect. Today, some marine protected areas are paper parks. There's not that much value that they protect. Uh, as you can see from this map, uh, the critical areas tend to be closer to land. And of course, those are often the areas also affected by um, economic activity and human activity. Um, so a knowledge-based approach to this is absolutely essential. Now, we're in the situation where we have an enormous amount of complex problems to solve in the ocean uh, relating to climate change, biodiversity loss, overfishing, nutrient pollution, etc. And they are complex and they're interrelated. We also have uh, an enormous amount of opportunity for more activity uh, in the ocean economy, and they will be competing for space. This is an example uh, of all the different uh, net positive activities that you can do with and in and on the ocean, as long as you do it in the right ways. And they can compete, they, they need to um, be given the opportunity to, to grow and develop. But in order for that to happen, we need an altogether different approach to ocean management. Uh, for too long, uh, there's been a sort of free-for-all attitude uh, when it comes to the ocean, relating again to the too big to fail uh, thesis. Uh, but we really need now, in order both to address the problems and seize the opportunities, to take a new approach. And that's why the high-level panel uh, main conclusion, main commitment from these 14 states is to give the ocean 100%, 100% ocean management. Uh, they commit to uh, put 100% of their national jurisdiction under uh, sustainable management uh, guided by development of sustainable ocean plans, which are integrated, developed through and taking into account the need for ecosystem-based management and the need to manage and plan and cater for sustainable ocean uh, economic activity. That 100% principle is key. Many of you know, and it's already been referred to, the call for 30% protection of uh, global ocean territories by 2030. That's also something the Ocean Panel supports. But the 30% principle of the 30% target is not enough. Um, if, you, if you protect 30% and leave the 70% to waste, that's not going to do uh, what is needed. So we need also a 100% approach to managing the ocean sustainably. And that's a call uh, that these 14 uh, governments have made or a commitment they made of themselves. It is also a call for other governments to join in that 100% ambition. So that by 2030, all governments take full responsibility for the full uh, ocean territory. You can find more about the work of the Ocean Panel and all the 20 scientific or expert reports underpinning the work on the Ocean Panel website. And the Ocean Panel was not only about producing a paper, they're going on uh, with implementation and rallying more countries to the effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vivar. And I can see that the questions are rolling in. So everyone in the audience, uh, continue asking questions. We will pick them up um, later on in the event. So then we're going to move on to the last speaker, Birgit Leon, uh, the CEO of the Ocean Opportunity Lab. So the screen is yours, uh, Birgit. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here with you this morning. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm going to share a bit about you of uh, the work and collaboration opportunities presented by the Ocean Opportunity Lab. Um, let's see here. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So I think we all agree, uh, all of us here today, that we really need to act. We see that um, in a time where humans and nations aim to extract much more resources from the ocean, uh, 
the ocean's health is actually deteriorating. There is an unlashed power of innovation within our ocean industries. Today, we have a number of silos, which we that also pointed to among the existing industries. Um, there is a lack of transparency. There is an access, uh, a lack of access for resources for the right uh, change makers. And we see that a lot of the problem solvers and change makers ability to find and connect with each other. Uh, it's not really there. So we see that it is a huge potential for better and faster solutions, which is currently being lost. Uh, for the past 15 years, I've been working uh, across the maritime and ocean industries globally, focusing on bridging the generation gap for a more sustainable ocean future. So uh, just as Vida pointed out, 30% is not enough. What we say is that the ocean industries needs to be completely emission free and waste free with new business models that are built to regenerate life and resources in the ocean. So our mission in that is basically practically building on the SDG 17 collaboration for the goals. Because what we have seen is that there's not today a level playing field. We believe that in order to reach uh, an, an evolution of an emission and waste free ocean industries, we need to work with the next generation, their ability and interest in leading and creating the change and also converting this generation of climate activists into becoming business activists, delivering the solution that our world and the ocean needs. Um, but today we see that the big corporates and the big organizations, they have global networks, they have alliances, they have resources, they have benefits to work really efficiently. They have the opportunity to keep power. But what about the small innovators? That's what we have been looking into. There is a huge and critical gap and that is the entrepreneurs and change makers access to existing resources. The problem is not that the resources aren't there, but the grassroots entrepreneurs, change makers and problem solvers, they very often live in different worlds than the big corporates and the players who have the resources. So we see that uh, they experience a lack of access to the established structures and a lack of connectivity among themselves uh, when it's um, a, um, a question of change makers working on the same challenges, but in other communities and regions. So we thought that by creating a transparent map and network of ocean and energy innovators, enabling them to find, share and connect with each other and the optimal resources, we wanted to really do a different type of initiative to help accelerating and empowering generation cleanup. Because we thought, what if today's problem solvers can spend most of their time building solutions rather than chasing existing and available resources? So this is what we have just launched uh, this past week, the tool Spawn, uh, a matchmaking and opportunity creation platform built by, with and for entrepreneurs. Um, in the platform, we have had a huge focus on, um, on creating a community that spans across borders and that actually uh, takes up the key uh, critical lack of resources and time and people that entrepreneurs and change makers are often experiencing. And then opening this up as a worldwide opportunity and marketplace where you can both get your solution out but you can also call out in the community for what type of resources that you need to get to the next level and to commercialize and build uh, your business and solutions. So here is just some, some uh, a few screens of this. So this is the world's first interactive global map for ocean and energy innovators. Today we have partners across 22 countries uh, around the world and it's currently growing. Uh, in here, you can find big established players that are seeking entrepreneurs to collaborate with. And we can also find entrepreneurs that are seeking strategic partners uh, in other parts of the world, in their own countries, uh, soft funding, there are competitions in here, etc. And uh, we wanted to really open up this ocean of opportunities. So we have worked very closely with real 
startups and innovators around the world to figure out how to really create a, a tool that could help. So what we have tested this on is really to look at the, the a fast track for better innovation and uh, collaboration between innovation actors, R&D, educational institutions, and the commercial environments that are both the startups and scale-ups and also the corporates. But we have looked the, um, at the building process of this in uh, tech for good and the pay it forward approach. Uh, and we have now tested this with matching collaboration projects with partners, matching scientists and, and uh, professors in universities with startups, uh, funding mechanisms that are seeking the right innovators, uh, various competitions worldwide, but also startups and innovators that needs test facilities or pilot customers to verify their solutions and to really get to the next step. So I wanted to uh, show you some of our regenerative focused innovators and, and partners. So we have here in Norway, we have a lot of amazing clusters and I wanted to bring three of them uh, up here. We have the NCE aquaculture that is based up in the northern part of Norway. They are actively now working with and, and looking for um, new solutions uh, to handle the aquaculture uh, fields. We have Blue Legacy, which is a little bit further down uh, uh, the northwest coast of Norway. Um, they are both uh, drilling into new business models and new ways of utilizing resources from um, the aquaculture uh, sphere. Um, we have Nordic Circular Hotspot that gathers actually all, all the Nordic countries and cities focused on circular business model and where we are their partner on the uh, ocean space. Then we have individual startups, uh, EC Marine uh, that works on on uh, offshore renewable energy. We have Seas of Norway uh, that works with water quality. Uh, we have Oguri that builds a full uh, value chain for, uh, for reusing uh, plastic from the sea and where you actually rent out the recycled material. Uh, we have Talasso uh, that are currently uh, developing a, a solution to tackle the um, uh, the Sargassum seaweed issues in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, their model is also highly scalable to other regions, but they are looking then at new ways of utilizing this as biomass uh, for other industries. And we have Blue Oceans Partners, who are also part of the Thousand Ocean Startups, which is uh, one of the responses to VDAR's work. Uh, they are investing in, in startups that delivers on sustainable ocean issues. Uh, and we have uh, Empower and Plastic Odyssey in Norway and France that works on um, the plastic pollution uh, challenges. So these are a few that I wanted to just bring out to you today. We have a lot of innovators and startups that are actively now looking at the various parts of the world and really connecting across borders uh, to look at where there may be one change maker that has a part of the solution that could optimally, optimally uh, fit their solution with another startup or founder, and uh, both could then collectively build a better solution together. Um, we have a campaign going on now, which is called Get on the Map, because as we are uh, introducing this first global interactive map for the startups, we are also towards World Ocean Day on the 8th of June, we are mapping the world of ocean and energy startups. So uh, any startups out there that has a solution but lack uh, the resources or network to become visible, uh, we have now opened this up uh, for everyone. Uh, there are not only startups in there, but there are also actors who represent the resources uh, that you need to succeed. So uh, we are releasing our map on June 8th and we are celebrating uh, everyone with the Startup Awards 11th June. So that was just our call to action and our way of, uh, of really um, bringing people together across this sphere. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to the discussions. Thank you so much, Brigitte, and thank you for the lovely examples. And 
Uh, perhaps you want to write the web page uh, in the chat so that people who want to learn more about your community can go in and, and read more about it there. Um, we have now heard from all of our three main speakers. And as I mentioned previously, where do we go from here? Um, some of you might want to continue this dialogue. Some of you want, want to stay connected after this webinar series is over. So now we're going to hear from my colleague, Thomas Berman, who some of you who have followed the series uh, previously have heard from before. And for those who haven't, uh, you'll be introduced to uh, Regeneration Mauritius and how to stay connected further. So Thomas, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Sophia. I'm very happy to see everyone. And thank you so much for extremely interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I uh, made quite a few notes and, and you know, there's so many things that we actually can do. And, and there's a few things that are, are really resonated with me is, is all, you know, all the knowledge we already have uh, and all the solutions we already have. Uh, and this is something that uh, is really why we've also started Regeneration Mushes. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's really about now making this, this knowledge and, and the solutions uh, happen uh, and through that creating system change. So for those of you who don't know, Regeneration Mushes is a new initiative. We are uh, aiming to build Mushes as a laboratory, a platform for food system innovation in the region and hopefully also globally uh, and being an example of how do we actually you take all this knowledge and all these solutions and then shift the system into a more regenerative um, food system. So we are uh, at this moment focusing um, on building and, and starting the initiative. Uh, it will be both, with, uh, you know, uh, we will both be working on, on food when it comes to food on land, but also food in the ocean. And this is why this, this event is so important for us. And we're really curious to, to connect and get engaged with more people who work uh, with ocean and, and uh, uh, the food side of ocean. But as Vidar you know, very eloquently pointed out today, it's, uh, it's all about you know, everything is interlinked. So I guess it's, it's also about how do we uh, not only look at direct how do we get you know, food from the ocean directly, but also how do, can we create more food? How can we make the ocean regenerative so it, it actually will, I think you said we, uh, we can feed us six times more, uh, we can get six times more food out of the ocean than we're doing today if we do it correctly. And then we come into conservation and, and, and I, I thought it was really interesting the discussion on how can we protect more ocean areas. And, um, and this, I guess, in, in, from Mauritius and, and uh, in the ocean and this part of the Indian ocean, I think it's really important. And your comment, Shama, on, on the military side of this, it's, you know, it, it really shows how geopolitic uh, this, these questions are and, and how we really need now to be brave. You know, we have to, to really think uh, bold, be bold on our visions, be bold on our actions. Uh, time is running out. Uh, if we really want to say to our children that we, we didn't make an effort, uh, it's now. And I think uh, the pandemic that we're you know, in the middle of is um, maybe you know, the, the lifetime opportunity for us to change it, to change the systems, because now the, the world is in shock. And that means that we are in a position to, to build back better. But then I, I believe the voices like in, in everyone is here today, we need really to come together and push forward. So this is what we hope to do with Regeneration Wishes, and, and that is really about creating an infrastructure for everyone, not only the global players, not only the people who are already working on this field, the people who want to take part of it. So both uh, citizens, uh, the startups you're mentioning, Birgit, but also government, and public sector, private sector actors coming together and really seeing how can we collaborate and partner up uh, to change uh, or create the change we need. I, I also, as, as I felt the, the speakers today, I've been focusing on all the opportunities. And I really, really think that's the discussion we need to have. We know the challenges, but we need to now get people on board on, on the opportunities. And that's why I really like the, the regenerative approach. 
because it's about creating more. How can we create more every solution we do? Uh, and I think it's a positive approach that will engage a lot more people. So it's not about sustaining us, not about taking things out or you know, not doing stuff. It's actually doing, yes, different stuff, but we have to do more. Um, and, and one of the ideas that has come up uh, through the discussions, uh, so I know there's one of the people on the call now, is just take, for instance, the Chagos Islands, which is a hot uh, topic uh, in, in this area of the world, um, military base. You know, what, what if that was a protected area? What if we came together with you know, the Great Britain and, and the world and said, this will actually change it from a military area to, to a protected area? And our ocean park. How could that actually create more food and more sustainability uh, and, and help regenerate the whole Indian Ocean? So uh, with that, uh, I would just like to, to point out to you, so if you are interested in being part of, of both building but using this platform, uh, which is going to be physically located in Mauritius, but will work with the whole region, uh, please go into uh, onto our website. I'll post it in, in the comments. Uh, sign up for the newsletter. Uh, that is the best and surest way to get information on, on what is what will happening in this laboratory. And there's also an event next Friday where we invite all organizations who are interested or curious about how can I take part in this? How can I use this platform? How can I become part of owning and building this platform? Uh, so I'll post that also afterwards uh, um, in the comments as next Friday, quite early if you're in Europe, 8 a.m. Um, quite nice time if you're in Mauritius, 10 a.m. Uh, and, and, and one of the reasons why we feel and why I've moved to Mauritius is because I, you know Mauritius is actually doing a lot of things in these areas. Uh, the government is really trying to, to push forward new ways of, of uh, building uh, its economy, uh, and I, for one, believe that you know the future Mauritius is really in the sustainability world, becoming a global example of change. And and we've been lucky today also to have uh, the um, economic development board uh, present on on this webinar. So I would like to just give the word briefly to uh, Dr. Drishti Ramdini, who can also give a brief introduction of of the strategies and thoughts uh, the Mauritian government has on this in this area. So, Drishti, if you're, um, yeah, should thank be able you. To unmute yourself, thank you yeah, thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you uh, for this opportunity to to have a few words in this very interesting webinar, and thanks for to the speakers also. It's been some very insightful uh, presentation that we have had. Um, maybe just in terms of um, uh, thinking back on what had been said. Um, I think that the importance of regeneration and sustainability is essential for all of us. And it is a driver of future growth in, in everything that we do, that is for, for sure. And, uh, and that being said, I think that I would like to ponder on two specific aspects that has been spoken. One about the ocean as a climate solution, and second, the importance of the resource regeneration. Uh, it is very clear and it is very important for island states like Mauritius, developing island states, developing coastal states. Uh, for us, the economies are very much geared and very much a focus on fishing and seafood processing in general. And for many countries like Mauritius, uh, this, uh, the climate change, over-exploitation, historical over-exploitation, has led to, cert to certain requirements to abide to sustainability aspects that today is imposing on us a certain burden of development. And, uh, but Mauritius has taken commitments in aligning with the sustainability issues, in, the, in aligning with uh, sustainable quotas of certain species that are in danger. But it is also very important to think in a very broad way. It is good to think, it's very important to, to, to stick to the sustainability issue. But the sustainability issue, for example, with one SDG goal can also be linked to other SDG goal. For example, um, goals linked to economic development, poverty, access to food, food security, etc. So it is also very important to think about then how to equip those countries, those economies who are suffering from those kind of burdens from false exploitation 
in revamping the economy. For example, when we are talking about ocean regeneration, it is extremely uh, important that we analyze how to develop new quota systems, how to identify new species, because as, as somebody mentioned, and very well so, uh, the, uh, how to mention, the, uh, the, new, the, the resource assessment is not so much known in the Indian Ocean, and particularly in our region, for example. But these required very specialized equipment, specialized ships, trawlers, or whatever it is, to be able to define what are the new, what are those other resources that can be um, harnessed in a sustainable way, such that the economy can keep on going, the food security aspect and whatever job, the job can be maintained while allowing for other resources to regenerate. I think that's a question which is very important for us also. And we'd be happy to deep dive into how those kind of strategic support in supporting those, uh, I would say, uh, burdens that those kind of countries are getting. And when we, you talk about climate solution, for instance, this is extremely interesting. There was all the presentation about renewable energy, carbon sick tax. There's also the aspects of marine permaculture that can be important among others. But again, these are segments that countries like Mauritius and many others require expertise to develop. For example, how do we develop a carbon market based on the protection of seagrasses. How do we analyze how far permaculture could increase the carbon capture in our ocean and derive from there blue money, let's call it like that, blue money that can engage into development of sustainable, um, sustainable structures. When we talk about renewable energy, the guiding principle in every country is to produce energy at a reliable cost and accessible to its population. And how far can there be support, not only to mention that we need to do renewable energy, but further to that, what kind of renewable energy and how, what kind of de-risking factor in terms of finance, in terms of technology can be brought such that any purchase agreement that can be thought of is done on a clear uh, financial perspective. So I think that all the insights, we are very happy about all the insights that have been mentioned, and we thank you for that. But I, I wanted, we wanted to share also, right, the, uh, that the, the, the sustainability aspect should also be thought of, and somebody said it very well, I really like that word, he said, how do we move from climate activists to business activists? So how do we translate the sustainability issues into support potential, and how do we translate them further to, to new segments of sustainable development that is very fair and supportive to, um, to small uh, island states that are really um, in need of such support. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for this opportunity. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Dristi. Uh, we, we didn't see you. Uh, your camera was off. Uh, but I, I can assure you that he is real, for those who don't know him. Uh, <laughs> and I, I think um, your points are, are really important. Uh, and I can just say from a personal point of view, um, and, and luckily you know, being part of, of this core team working to create regeneration wishes. And now with uh, you know, me being Norwegian, having the link to Norway, uh, I, I, I really believe you know, if, we, if we can come together and, and really truly create a vision for wishes, that wishes re really want to build a, a, a solid economy uh, that will also show the world how that can be done in a regenerative, sustainable way. Uh, I am, for one, will use all, all the network I have uh, to convince uh, Norwegian experts, governments, uh, research councils, and so forth to collaborate uh, with Mauritius and, and bring resources and experts. Because I think also for Norway and a lot of countries, I think uh, connecting with a country like Mauritius can be quite interesting. If, if they want to lead uh, and be part of leading sustainable change globally. So that's at least an invitation. And, and this is, I really hope that it can be an integrated part of regeneration issues as a platform. Um, but I also like to just give um, the word to, to um, Bernardo Nascimento, because I, I, uh, there's a lot of things happening in Mauritius. And, and uh, one of the things that we are eager to do is, is really how do we connect? How do we connect? Oh, sorry, Drishti, I think you're you're mute. Okay, good. How can we connect with uh, a lot more people 
not only those uh, at this call or other people who, who are sort of part of the sustainable discussion, but citizen in general. People are working in different fields who don't normally think of, of a role in the food system. And, and what you're doing, um, Bernardo, I think with the Oceanarium is, is really interesting uh, in bringing awareness, uh, but also knowledge to a lot more people both in Mauritius, but also hopefully you know, when, when the country opens up again to people wanting to visit Mauritius. So maybe you can just uh, give, tell us a little bit about your plans and uh, what you're doing in the closed air and ocean area. Thank you, Thomas. Um, well, first I just wanted to say that I'm really excited with all the speakers that we had today. I really, just three quick words. Uh, Shama, I, I really love your braveness and all that you have been done. It's good to see youth people involved in these initiatives. Mr. Uh, Algerson, uh, there was something you said that really caught my attention. I don't know even if I understood it well, which was this change of, of paradigm for the 30% of the ocean coast that we need to protect to go to a life of 100% that needs to be changed. And, and that is a big sentence if I understood it well. And then uh, Pete, uh, really like all that you are doing with, with putting all these youth and all these different projects around the world connected. That is really awesome, impressive. And I just want to say well done to all of you. Then um, I will tell very, very briefly about Odiseo. So Odiseo, for those that don't know, it's an aquarium that has been to be open here in Mauritius. It's uh, in the final phase of construction and uh, we should open in the next couple of months quite a high standard aquarium in the sense of uh, animal welfare. But more than that, it is um, quite ambitious in what concerns education, science and conservation. And uh, in the sequence of what Thomas said, and we had a, a nice chat just a couple of days ago, the, the aquariums, they have something extremely important, which is an extreme visibility for the public. And we feed on, on research, we feed on great initiatives in the sense that we, we want the world to know these initiatives. We want the world to have the knowledge that most of the time is not accessible to most of the people. And so one of the reasons why I'm here today is also to invite you to get in touch with us, to, to, to really uh, remind you that we are here to, to serve you and to serve the community. And the people that is behind this project, I mean, the, the promoters of these projects, for sure, and today there was this climate activist, economist, econo economist activist, which I really agree that is a great concept. So we need to be financially efficient, but there is really good intentions behind this project. So this is not a financial project in the sense that we want to make money, but we really want to make a contribution to the society and to the environment. And picking some words that Thomas said, and I agree with him, you know, Mauritius is a small country, and, and we had this chat a few days ago. And so it's, it's kind of a great lab, a great place to test initiatives that uh, hopefully can be an inspiration for bigger countries that, that are much harder to make changes. And, and so I'm all in. I'm all in on this initiative that Thomas is developing, that you uh, are all developing. I mean, the group that is behind this. So uh, yes, we are here. We are most happy to receive you. We are most happy to make any collaborations. And uh, I don't know if there is anything, Thomas, that I should add to this or any question from your side concerning what we talked previously. No, thank you That's so much. I, I think we're just, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I think I'll pass on to Sophie, but I think we're just gonna open for questions. There's a lot of questions in the chat, uh, but I think also um, if uh, Drishti is still here and also uh, you, Bernardo, I think, if there's a question for you, uh, I think we'll just open that. Won't be Sophie. Yes. So we have received a lot of questions. So thank you for all of you that have spoken today. We're just going to jump right into it. And if you have any questions to Bernardo or Tristri, then please write them in the chat and maybe you can follow up in the chat. So we're going to get all of the four speakers up on the screen here. So Birgit, Shama, Vidar and Thomas. The first question is from Sapna to Shama. Do you foresee a battle of which oceans to protect in priority? Uh, well, initially, the, the things that made scientists to study about the ocean protection agenda, about the 30 by 30 dimension, is 
to identify the productive areas in the ocean, to identify productive regions, to identify um, marine biodiversity hotspots. So basically, this this um, this report has already been generated by scientists, and they have conducted several studies. They have taken a lot of data, and they have seen that there are like just like on planet Earth, we have well on land. Sorry, we have like important tropical rainforest that needs to be protected, these really special ecosystems that we need to protect. Well, it's the same thing that they identified in the high seas. It's these regions that are really productive in terms of, in terms of life, in terms of di di biodiversity, in terms of the ecosystem itself. And, um, and actually the, the part about the Sahara de Mala is that it's identified as a productive area. It's identified as a marine biodiversity hotspot. So basically, yeah, it's a race to protect that 30% and it's the least that we can do to do it because right now we have less than 5% of the ocean protected. Protected, I think it's less than 5%. So um, these areas have already been identified. There's already a whole planning, a whole map about the ocean protection and these regions that we need to protect because um, every regions in the ocean they are not the same they don't have the same productivity and some are more special than the other and some have more life than the other this is why we need to protect the ones that are already more productive first and then with time we can actually be planning like a more sustainable approach for the 70 percent that is left because it's impossible to protect 100 percent right now knowing about the politics about where leaders and corporates how they're working let's be realistic but we have to at least start with the 30% and listen to what the scientists are saying because they have conducted the studies and they know what are the regions about the biodiversity. Thank you. V, that would you like to comment on the same question? Yeah, well, I think they, uh, first of all, I, I think uh, just to avoid misunderstanding, uh, I'm not advocating and the Ocean Panel wasn't advocating that 100% should be protected, but it should be managed. I mean, on land, we do area-based or spatial planning. Uh, very few countries do that uh, when it comes to their ocean territory. We need, because we need more activity with the ocean and because we have all the problems, there's a need for much more granulated, knowledge-based planning uh, for activity and protection. Uh, uh, in national ocean and within that 100 percent 30 percent should be protected well um how you go about identifying um which are the areas to be protected uh, i think they one of the great promises today with new technologies is that you can actually map resources and capacities um, and potential of the ocean uh, more precisely and at lower cost than you traditionally um, could do. Uh, ocean science has depended a lot on big science vessels uh, going on uh, journeys for years and years to map ocean territories. Today, through sensor technology, uh, underwater and overwater drones, etc., you can do much more uh, with high precision almost in real time and, and therefore assess the quality of the ocean uh, much better by sources than before. And through that, you can also identify which areas are the most important to protect partly or fully. And going from that, we also had a question for you, Vidar, on, um, on whether you know what parameters feed into the food production model, like what determines a high or a low potential for food production. Yeah, well, the, uh, if you go to the website of the panel, there's a, a special uh, report. We commissioned a number of papers, which we, of course, didn't call white papers, but blue papers, and they're all available on the, on the website. And one of them was on the future of food production from the sea. Now, what we know is that what we, did, what we have, the conventional wisdom has been that we're sort of up against the ceiling when it comes to wild catch. But some of these new models indicate that through targeted protection and better fisheries management, you can actually boost also wild catch. That global map I show you uh, has been applied to some uh, countries. Costa Rica, for example, if I'm not mistaken, the assessment there with a more granu finely granulated analysis 
was that they could double their tuna through protecting 30% of their waters uh, because of the dynamics of, of protection in terms of regenerating tenacity. The wild catch is one option. And then when it comes to aquaculture, um, there are opportunities for land-based aquaculture and uh, ocean-based uh, aquaculture, mariculture. And the biggest potential is for low trophic species and non-fed species. In my country, Norway, uh, salmon farming is a big thing. And uh, that has, um, as Birgit was addressing, uh, some environmental challenges. The biggest one in climate terms is actually uh, feed. So you need to get more sustainable uh, feed for that kind of agriculture. But for low trophic species, mollusks, uh, oysters, mussels, uh, you can produce, they have a very high protein value, and you can produce them with very little uh, environmental footprint. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the national waters of New Zealand can produce as much protein as South America in terms of cattle. So uh, it's quite telling. Thank you for elaborating. Um... This one goes to both you, Birgit, and then Vidar, if you want to comment after. Uh, a question from Thomas. Uh, regarding the offshore wind, uh, East and Southeast Indian Ocean has a lot of cyclones. Is offshore wind viable in such conditions? Birgit. Yes, I, I would say that, you know, there are many different ways of producing renewable energy uh, offshore. So you don't necessarily have to look at the current kind of uh, uh, long windmills that we see today. So I, I think that uh, lower uh, floating of solar wind constructions, uh, but also looking at kind of the, the micro turbine grid systems that you can actually put under the surface. Uh, and by then removing a lot of the uh, challenges related to extreme winds and uh, and waves. So I would say that you know, don't just look at offshore wind, but look at the offshore renewable mix. Um, yeah, we also see that uh, one of our partners in in Israel they have an amazing uh, solution for um, for uh, producing uh, renewable energy in ports and and uh, molos and areas where there are big um, waves and massive uh, forces so that you can actually, in some cases, also utilize those extreme forces that comes by nature uh, to the better, if you have the right technology in place. Any other comments on the same question? Well, I could add that there is, uh, I mean, there exists global math and global analysis of which ocean domains are most needed for Wind and clearly um, cyclones and hurricanes are not conducive, um, but uh, technology is obviously evolving. Shama, did you have anything to add? I see that you're unmuted. Oh, sorry, no, I forgot to mute, but I don't have anything to add. It's not my expertise, so thanks. But then I have another question from you, uh, also from uh, Thomas, who uh, is asking how can the military be influenced to work for biodiversity or sustainability and this kind of takes us a little bit back to the Chagos Island examples perhaps. Do you have any yeah. comments on this? I do have a lot of comments on that one. <laughs> um, well first of all when we're talking about military it's impossible to talk about military and have sustainability at the same time because first of all um, like for example us here in the Indian Ocean we don't feel safe with the presence of weapons um, it's, it's not okay to have weapons on islands, especially that we are peaceful people. And second of all, the case of Chagos, when we're talking about it specifically, um, the Chagosians have been uh, removed, literally removed from the island and they, they haven't been allowed to return back, which is really bad. So that goes against the human rights. And um, the Chagos area has been declared a marine protected area but that's how it's, it's really tricky because it's declared a marine protected area. I think the world's largest marine protected or area or one among the largest. And, uh, and yet we still have a military base that is causing pollution in the lagoon there. 
we still have um, the ship, the sonos that are affecting the whales. And um, so you can see how this is not very coherent at all because we cannot have military and sustainability at the same time. Um, for me personally, I don't think that we can ever resolve the climate issue, the ecological crisis without the inclusion of the people in it because um, we form part of nature, we form part of biodiversity, we form part of the planet system, we form part of the ecosystem and the marine ecology as well. And um, we can't truly have um, sustainability without getting the people, the people back on the island and uh, without really um, removing weapons from the Indian Ocean because this is not okay. I mean, at the time where we're facing the climate crisis, we're getting droughts, um, we're getting floods, we're getting rising temperatures. We absolutely need to take care of how how we, I mean, of our relationship with the environment, uh, with nature itself. We can't keep um, keep doing the same thing over and over again. And I know that military is not something that is being addressed a lot by environmentalists or activists, but um, it's we have to talk about it because, like I said earlier, the blue whale populations from the Diego Garcia they could be um, going to Saadamala, they could be going elsewhere, and we might be protecting the Saadamala, but then the blue whales from the Diego Garcia they're not protected, you know. So yeah, this is what I mean by that we need to remove it. If I just can add a comment there. Um... Yeah. Well, I think it's also interesting if, if you know, since climate change uh, is also a security risk, uh, you know, it's going to be a lot of people having to move from where they live. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of conflict. Uh, so I'm also just, could we frame, you know, how, how, how good are we at framing um, in the work to, to, to save our climate and biodiversity as also a way of, of reducing risk for, uh, for conflict? Um, and, and could this be a sort of a new task of the military to be part of this because this is a, a preemptive uh, action um, to, to try to reduce the risk of uh, military or armed conflict? I think this is a, this this is at least for me is quite a sort of a, I'm, I'm not known in this in the military field at all, uh, but I, th I think if if we are to said if you are to really solve something, we have to also have that, uh, at least people who know that side of the world, uh, part of the discussion, because, because this is gonna be so important to get these big agreements through, I, I would think. Yes, I think that's very important to have all of the voices at the table. And I think you said that very well, well Shama, that regenerative practices are inclusive, and that has to be at the core uh, of the philosophy of the regenerative. Um, for Vidar, another question from Sapna. What is the consequence of low um, oxygen levels? Why is it worrisome? Um, and how come the Arctic has warmed so much faster than the rest? Are there areas of the same size in the North Atlantic that show similar changes? Um, well, low oxygen we can simply start with ourselves. What would it mean for us if we lack oxygen? Uh, when ocean is derived of oxygen, it simply loses life. Um, it's a big killer of marine life. Uh, and it's, I mentioned this in the context of nutrient pollution, but the interplay of nutrient pollution, wastewater pollution, and warming of oceans uh, are all adding to um, the oxygenizing uh, Ocean. So another example of how these things are interplaying. Uh, when it comes to the Arctic, um, obviously scientists are all over that question. Why is the Arctic warming uh, so much faster? Uh, we're, we're already at uh, almost uh, three degrees uh, warming in the Arctic, um, while the world is fast approaching 1.5. Uh, in terms of actual global warming, it's twice as much in the Arctic. Um, and I, I don't think science is fully, has fully established all the reasons, but one reason um, often quoted is that when ice is melting, the, reflex, the reflection from the white cover disappears. And what comes in its stead? Dark water, which absorbs um, 
um, we need more than four rather than than sending lead back. Uh, and then there are also uh, there's also new evidence pointing to changing currents and the mixing of water from ocean layers. Uh, the fact that ice adds fresh water to uh, to the oceans, all these contributing to um, exacerbating heating. So lots of complex earth processes that we are now interfering with um, at our peril. Sorry, can I just comment on that? Uh, well, what it means about low oxygen zones in the ocean is that usually in, in the water, we have um, something, a parameter called dissolved oxygen. And we need dissolved oxygen in the water because the fish, they when they, when they breathe, they need the dissolved oxygen to breathe. And uh, literally every fish and um, other marine animals, they need that um, dissolved oxygen to be able to survive. And, um, and if we are talking about low levels of oxygen in the water, we, means that we mean that the water has, um, well, it doesn't have enough oxygen for some animals, which means that they, can, they cannot survive they cannot adapt because that change in like the marine animals, they're really sensitive to changes in the chemical parameters in the water. So basically, if you see a small change in the, uh, the concentration of dissolved oxygen in the water, it can affect the animals because, because they cannot adapt to it. They cannot breathe in properly and then they cannot function and then they die. So that's one thing. And the second thing about the Arctic region, why it's melting so fast is because first of all, it's uh, just like the Indian Ocean, it's surrounded by land. So um, the land, it generates a lot of heat, a lot of heat. And um, basically the area of the Arctic is, well, it's not small, but I mean, it's surrounded by a piece of land which has a, which has a big heating. I mean, the, the Arctic itself has a big um, heating capacity, which means that it heats up really quickly in a small amount of time because it's not surrounded by any more ocean. It's not like the Pacific, it's not large. It's a small area. It's like a, doing an experiment. We take a big, bu a, a small bucket and then a big bucket. It's the small one that's gonna heat up really fast. So that's what's happening as well um, in the Arctic. But yeah, the low level of oxygen is bad for animals. And yeah, and it's gonna contribute to ocean acidification as well. Thank you for elaborating. And Vidar, how can the no Nobel laureates and all the knowledge they have be made accessible through initiatives like the Oceanarium in Mauritius? Well, I, I think Nobel laureates are uh, like human beings uh, elsewhere or other human beings. They're uh, a diverse bunch. Uh, some of them are very happy to uh, engage uh, globally in different uh, discussions. Uh, we recently had uh, something called the Nobel Prize Summit which gathered uh, some 40 Nobel laureates across planetary challenges on the, uh, on the agenda. And they, from that, uh, they also issued a statement, uh, which you can find on the nobelprize.org website, on uh, a call for action for, for our planet. Uh, so obviously they're committed um, and, um, and many of them are accessible and they're, they're uh, concerned about these issues. Yes, and we are uh, all people in the room here as well who are different. And I have a question to all of the speakers today. Um, we know that there's a lot of challenges. We know that there's a lot of opportunities with the ocean and we all come from different backgrounds. We do different things and we know that there's a need for change in the policy level, but also at the individual level. So do you have any last tips to all of us watching today? What can we as individuals do um, to better the oceans? A little think thinking time. I, I, I can... <laughs> I can try. I mean, uh, one thing is, of course, to go out and uh, start building solutions. But if you don't have the kind of the capabilities or capacities to 
to actually, you know, build the solutions, I would say there are so many ways of supporting the entrepreneurs and change makers. So it could be anything from, you know, co-financing or micro financing initiatives supporting those startups. It could be joining in as an advisor, um, uh, making sure that that uh, your uh, your uh, pension money goes into green funds. Uh, making sure that items that you purchase as a consumer are actually ocean and environment friendly. So there, I mean, there are many small and bigger things that we can do, but I, I really would like to push for uh, our role in moving green investments as well. And that's something that most of us can do if, um, if we have uh, a pension scheme, whether we are a company or an uh, individual person. Thank you, Birgit. Uh, Bernardo, did you want to add something? Yes, I just want to, to, you know, this is a really interesting question. And, and sometimes we, I think we make it harder than it really is. So one, one of the, the missions that we have here in the aquarium, and I think that is kind of slightly different from previous projects, there is a lot of awareness at this moment around the world. I mean, everybody knows about plastic problems. Everybody goes about, knows about global warming. But there is this challenge, which is this behavior change. And, and it requires two things. Sometimes courage like Sharma and Bridget and Vidar had to, to take action and do things. But what I want to add to this is that there is very tiny things that if we start doing, it will make the difference. So for sure, we can make it big, but we can make it tiny. And, and I think that people sometimes, they, they, they just get this illusion that if I don't do something big, things will not change. But the tiny contribution sent in the house of each one of us, either when we are shopping, or either when we are at house, either when we go to a natural park and we just do the right behaviors, it will change completely everything. And so, and that is part of the thing that we hope that we can do here in the aquarium. And so really last, last thought is, Start small, don't worry. It doesn't matter how small it is, but if you do something small, and especially if you do it every single day, consistency makes the difference. And that will change the world for sure. And that was just my small uh, contribution, thanks. Yes, I really do agree that consistency do make a, a difference. Uh, Shama, any last thoughts? Uh, I would just uh, add to what Bernanda said. That's true. Um, simple actions, they, they can change things. Um, what I think about um, when we are thinking about regenerative practices is that we don't need extremely high tech technology. We already have um, ingenious minds. We already have people. We already have um, a connection with the environment. We need to think a bit more about um, how we are going to live uh, in symbiosis with the environment and how we are going to help them regenerate so they can help us in, in, in back. Um, so I'm um, all about um, the solutions. They exist already in nature. They exist in our head. They exist in nature, in the ecosystems, in the biodiversity, in the in life that is present already on the planet because let's not forget that life has evolved for millions of years and they know better than us. They have their own factions. They have their roles. They know how to do things. Um, so yeah, I think that we need to think a bit more about how we can nurture that relationship so that um, nature can regenerate itself again and in turn it can, well, help us back. Very good point. And I think that's what makes the regenerative approach exciting because it does display the possibilities. Like Thomas mentioned before, it's not about the limits, but what we can do and, and the positive benefits of that. Vidar, a last comment? Uh, well, I, I obviously, we can all look at our the way we uh, spend energy, uh, the food we eat, our consumption patterns, our transportation patterns. Um, so a lot we can do in our daily lives. But I'd like also to say that as voters and as uh, actors in society, we can also try to highlight the increasing uh, opportunity in the right solutions. I mean, the right solutions for the planet are also solutions that can create jobs. Politicians have to 
do what they can to create jobs. Uh, and and uh, we see now um, opportunities, not least in the ocean economy. And our last point for the innovators and entrepreneurs, what we're seeing now globally in terms of finance is unprecedented. Over the last year, more has happened in terms of sustainability thinking in global finance than for the previous decades. Uh, so money is now moving very strongly in a green direction and hopefully in a blue direction. What is needed therefore are projects that are uh, investment opportunities. So uh, uh, in terms of, uh, and there's an increasing recognition also in finance of nature, of natural need to protect nature in order to sustain long-term uh, economic uh, opportunities as well. So uh, that is a huge opportunity for those among us, I'm not one of them, who are innovators and entrepreneurs. Thank you. And Thomas, do you have a comment? Yeah, I think uh, my thoughts on this is that we, we, we shouldn't think that someone else will fix this. I'm meeting a lot of people said, yeah, we, we need government to do something or we need some, the big corporates to do something or we need someone else to do something. And, and that's been my journey is, is actually realizing that the world is just us. You know, it, it's at the, uh, obviously there's a lot more uh, um, organization and stuff that needs to be part of it, but it starts, you know, we just have to start doing stuff and we have to come together. I think, I think the, 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 like you're doing Birgit, and I know there's a lot of other initiatives also coming together as people. And then it's, you know, it's not only people like grassroots, it's actually people, you know, like you, Vida, who's, who's been in the government a long time, um, and also from the university, from who's, who's at EDB or wherever you're working. Uh, it's us, you know, we, we have to do it. And, and I think even if you're not an expert, you don't know anything about the ocean, but you want to be part of it, that's enough. That's what you, all you need. You don't need any more uh, knowledge or, or, or ideas or thoughts. You don't need to be an innovator, uh, but connect, you know, be part of it, engage in it uh, and learn. And through that, you will see that you have something to contribute with. Um, and I'll, I'll really uh, second, or, no, it's going to be third, uh, that it's, the consistency is the, it's the key. You know, you have to just keep going at it. We have to have active hope. We have to believe that if we try to do something today, it might lead to something. Uh, because we never, you know, we don't really see the consequences of what we do. But I, I do strongly believe that uh, we need to invite more people in. We need to create these kind of arenas where we come together as people and not as, you know, the, the businessman or the government body. Or you know, and, and this is uh, why we're creating regeneration wishes is, is to have this kind of platform. And there's a lot of other places you can go. I think that's my my last sort of I, I engage. It's really fun. It's, it's really interesting work. You meet so many cool people. Um, so it's, it's really a life changer. So it's a way to do it. So if you want to be part of this life changing momentum, then uh, be part of Regeneration Mauritius. I did just post the event that Thomas mentioned before in the chat. So follow up on that. And I just wanna say thank you very much to all of you speakers for today's presentations and for teaching us something new and opening up our horizons. And also thank you to all the participants. And it's been really exciting running these four seminars on regenerative practices. And I just wanna remind you that they are out there open uh, on our YouTube channel if you want to rewatch this one or one of the other ones. So with that being said, I hope you all have a, a lovely day and that we meet again uh, in another platform. So have a good Thursday, everyone.